Our speaker tonight is Mr. Robert Buford, who is a good friend of mine. He's a former professor, taught at several universities, uh, theater, and what else was it? Speech. And uh, he was taught down in Florida, he taught in Alabama, and uh, he now lives in Birmingham. He's a resident of Birmingham. And uh, anyway, he's going to talk on one of his ancestors, Abraham Buford. So if you know anything about Forrest, you know Abraham was one of his right hand men. But not much is known about Abraham, which I thought would be a great topic. So let's hear from somebody that knows a lot about him. And uh, so without any further effort, Robert, I'm going to turn it over right. to you. All right. Uh, is to introduce you to my, some of my family members. Uh, this is my cousin Abraham. Uh, Abraham would have been, he's from Kentucky, and he would have been, uh, probably if we were the same generation, we would probably be first cousins. And, uh, or somewhere in that general vicinity. I've never, I've never really understood all that stuff about first cousin twice removed and, and all that stuff. I don't know what, how many, how many removed we have, but he was probably about five generations ahead of, a, ahead of me, and, uh, and he was from the Kentucky Buford. So I want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, about some of the other Bufords too. First of all, uh, the second person here uh, is Colonel Abraham Buford, and yes, uh, that is the man that Abraham was named after. He was a, uh, a colonel in the Continental Army uh, in uh, 1780, and he was in the uh, um, confrontation with uh, with Tarleton, who was probably the most vicious, or at least we think, or I think, the most vicious uh, English, uh, you know, officer who was responsible for a lot of atrocities. And one of the atrocities that he was responsible for was the uh, Warfax, that's, um, how you pronounce that, John? Yeah, or and the Warhax. And uh, it was a massacre where uh, he attacked Carlton and found out real quick that he was uh, out, outmaneuvered or outmanned. And so what he did is he uh, surrendered, or at least he tried to surrender. And when they went forth with the with flag of truce, uh, Carlton's men massacred most of the, the people under under Abraham Buford. So that was, uh, that was a, uh, that was an early, early Buford, but he, he was a soldier in, uh, in the Continental Army. Now, the Buford family came to America from England in 1634 and uh, settled originally in Virginia. Uh, if you've ever been around Bedford, Virginia, uh, that is where they kind of, where they landed first off. Uh, there's, a, there's a house there, well, it used to be uh, right outside of Bedford used to be Bufordville, <coughs> and then they changed it. I think now it's called Montville, but uh, but anyway, it was uh, uh, that was where we first kind of lived when we got here. Uh, a portion of it uh, uh, of the family moved to Kentucky, and uh, uh, and there, the people we're going to talk about today, uh, most of them came from from Kentucky. Uh, a portion then moved. Some of them moved on up to Illinois. And then uh, my portion, that would be the, the poor Bufords, moved, uh, moved to North Alabama and became, became farmers. But uh, anyway, I'll introduce you to, to them. But I, I want to tell you a story about what started my interest in the uh, uh, Abraham Buford was <laughs> every year uh, we go, Bill and I, uh, go up to, and, and some other people in the room, go up to Franklin and uh, we visit the uh, Civil War relic show they have there every December. Well, about four years ago, five years ago, uh, I was up there. Now, my wife is a very frugal person, at least when it comes to my um, purchasing of Civil War <laughs> antiques or relics or whatever. Uh, she, she gives me $300, and she says, now, you can buy anything you want there, just bring me the change back. You know. <laughs> okay. If you've ever been to a Civil War show, there is no change. <laughs> so, it's your budget, right? That's right, yeah. So I'm, I'm sitting there, I got, my, I got my $300 safely tucked away in my pocket, and I'm looking around, and I notice right away that most things are in the thousands of dollars. So I thought, well, I'm not going to be buying much there. So I'm very you know, conscious of how much money I have to spend, 
Well, I'm down at the concession stand. When we got there, John went to, upstairs to the mezzanine and started looking up there. And I went downstairs to the concession stand and uh, I'm eyeing this hot dog there, thinking me and that hot dog are gonna have a relationship. And, <laughs> and my telephone rings. And I'm picking up John, said, you gotta come back up to the mezzanine. There's something up here you gotta see. I think you're gonna be really, really like it. And so I said, uh, well, what is it? And he says, it is a, there he goes. He said, it is a, uh, it is an autograph of your, of your cousin Abraham. And I thought, well, that's great. John, how much is it? He said, well, the guy wants $600 for it. And I said, well, John, I don't, I don't have $600. And he said, well, don't worry about it. I've already talked the guy down from $650 to $600. He'll negotiate. Well, he didn't negotiate much. But <laughs> no, anyway, I, I managed to uh, get on the phone and get permission from my purchasing agent. <laughs> and, she, and she gave me permission to get it. This is a picture of Abraham Buford, and that's his original signature, if you care to come have a look at it. So, so whatever happens today, it's John's fault. <laughs> All right, now, speaking of John's, uh, I want to introduce you to a couple of cousins here that are, that are uh, that wore the other color, you know, that blue color. And uh, first one is John Buford. John Buford, uh, was a, a Union uh, general. He was the John Buford. If you saw the movie Gettysburg, he was uh, played by Sam Shepard Elliot. in the oh, movie. Yeah. Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott. Sam Elliott. <coughs> I get my Sams mixed up sometimes. But Sam, Sam Elliott. But anyway, uh, he was one of the first people in the battle. He got there. Uh, in fact, uh, he started the battle. If you look at it right here, there you go. If you look at right here in front of the statue, this cannon right here fired the first shot of the battle. So he was one of the uh, of the people responsible for uh, you know stopping the Confederate advance down the Chambersburg Pike and was able to let the uh, uh, the Yankees get the uh, get the high ground over on Cemetery Ridge. But anyway, he was uh, he was considered by a lot of people to be the one of the outstanding cavalry commanders in the war. Um, he, uh, he was the, uh, he fought just before Gettysburg, he fought at, uh, at uh, Brandy, Brandy Station, Brandy Station, Brandy, Brandy Station, and he was wounded there. Uh, and what happened with John was that he, uh, he caught a, a uh, he got typhoid and, uh, Gettysburg was fought in uh, July of 63, and uh, John died of typhoid in December of 63. So he was, you know, he was out of the picture at that point. One of the things that I think is interesting is he was promoted to Major General uh, on his deathbed. And uh, good old uh, William Stanton uh, was given the, I told, was told that by Lincoln to give this man his, uh, his, you know, his rank increase. And Stanton told the man that took the, uh, the news to, uh, to Buford was, uh, make sure that the man's gonna die before you give him this, uh, this commission. You know, so, so he would, if he hadn't died, he probably would still have been a, a brother. All right, he had a, had a half brother. And uh, uh, these are the, these are the uh, Bufords that went to Illinois. Remember I told you, some of the folks went to up to Illinois. Well, they, they were from Kentucky, but they moved up to Illinois and set up a life up there. And uh, this gentleman was John's half-brother. Now, when John was in the Calvary, this gentleman is uh, Napoleon Bonaparte Buford, and he was, uh, he was more of an administrator than he was a field officer. So he uh, uh, commanded a lot of the, you know, the uh, administrative things, and he was commander of Helena, Arkansas, which I think is kind of interesting because uh, Patrick Claiborne, you know, he was his hometown was Helena, Arkansas. So, but anyway, uh, I don't think that they knew one another by any stretch of the imagination. Well, Bu Rock, Abraham Buford was uh, was their first cousin, and he lived in Kentucky, 
and uh, he was born in 1820 in Woodford, Kentucky, and he attended West Point, got his, got his uh, education at West Point, and graduated in 1841. Uh, when he graduated, he became the uh, first lieutenant in the Dragoons. Uh, I never knew what a Dragoon was until I you know, looked it up, and uh, it's a, a cavalry officer who also uh, dismounts and uses kind of, kind of a cross between a, I guess, a cavalry man and, and an infantry man. Right? Yeah, infantry man. Something, something like that, anyway. Um, he served uh, during his early years uh, in the frontier out in the western part of the, of the United States. And he was, uh, he was noted as being the largest, civil, uh, largest cavalry officer in the Confederate Army. He weighed about 320 pounds. So that was, uh, that was probably a lot for a horse to carry around, at least for most of the day. But anyway, that was, uh, that was one of his distinctions. All right, so he was in the, uh, he was in the Mexican War, and uh, he, played, he was in the uh, Battle of Buena Vista. Uh, he was brought to the captain, from lieutenant up to a captain, and later on served uh, throughout the New Mexico, western uh, United States area. He resigned in 1854 and returned to Kentucky to uh, pursue his, uh, his love of horses. He, he had a horse farm, a uh, very nice horse farm, raised thoroughbred race horses, was noted before the war as a, as a connoisseur of horse flesh. And uh, then after the war, he, I mean, after he, uh, after the Mexican War, he went back to uh, Kentucky to, to do that. And he held off joining the Confederate Army at the beginning. Remember, the, uh, Kentucky was, uh, was sort of a, a neutral state. They didn't have a, they weren't in, uh, uh, didn't want to join. In fact, they never actually joined the Confederacy. They, they may have wanted to, or at least some of them may have wanted to. But uh, they held off, and he held off until 1862 when, uh, when Morgan, uh, came into uh, the Kentucky uh, area, and uh, he joined uh, joined up there with them. Uh, and then uh, uh, after Prairieville, after the Battle of Prairieville, he covered Braxton Bragg's retreat uh, down uh, out of Kentucky. He was appointed uh, Brigadier General by Jefferson Davis, and uh, Jefferson Davis ordered him to go down to Mississippi and get with uh, uh, General Pendleton there at Vicksburg, or uh, in the defense of Vicksburg, uh, there around ja between Jackson and, and Vicksburg. All right, he was really noted to be his uh, in the uh, Battle of Champion Hill. Now, if you if you know about the Battle of Champion Hill, uh, Buford served under under William Lorry, who was the uh, general under under Joseph Johnston. And uh, they, they were sort of, had a close relationship, Johnston and, and Loring. And um, Johnston wanted to, to give up on Vicksburg. He wanted to let, just let the, you know, just let the Yankees have it. And uh, uh, jo Joseph Johnston and Davis saw that uh, Vicksburg was the key to the western part of the Confederacy. Without Vicksburg, everything on the western side, especially the Mississippi, was going to be open all the way from up north, all the way to the Gulf. So he saw, <clears throat> excuse me, he saw Vicksburg as the uh, as the key there. So during the battle, um, Pendleton got got orders to go from from the Vicksburg area out to about halfway. To Jackson, which is a place called Clinton, and Clinton uh, at Clinton, he thought he would have time to uh, to get a hold of uh, you know the uh, stand up to what was coming. All of a sudden, you know there was a whole lot of blue coats coming down the road, so he decided he would have to to back up a little bit. While he was fighting in a retreat back to get to Vicksburg, uh, part of his army, the one with Loring, got got separated, and. Uh, <coughs> Loring then, uh, because he couldn't join up with Pendleton, 
uh, took the road back to, to Jackson to defend Jackson. So there was a kind of a, a give and take back and forth through there. And at that, at that point, uh, <coughs> good old uh, Buford, being with Loring, uh, went back to the Jackson area and then later on over to the Tom Bigby area after Sherman moved in a stronger position there at Vicksburg. Well, after this, at this point, uh, Buford became associated with and assigned to uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, and uh, he was at, in, instrumental in the Battle of Tupelo. Uh, and then, uh, uh, at the Battle of Tupelo, he uh, he also was there around uh, Fort Fort Pillow. Fort Pillow, uh, when he was at Fort, Fort Pillow, he really wasn't there during the massacre or the alleged massacre, as some people would say. He was, uh, he was there and he was sent by Forrest to Paducah, Kentucky to, uh, to get horses and supplies. And so they were able to do that. Uh, so I don't believe he was actually there for the, for the, for the alleged massacre. I say alleged because it is a, you know, it's a heated discussion back and forth of whether, you know, people were actually surrendering or not. But if you know what supposedly happened there was that the Confederate soldiers uh, massacred uh, the uh, U.S. colored infantry that were there, uh, depending on which, which story you believe. All right, later on, uh, he was in, instrumental in uh, the Battle of Bryce's, Bryce's Crossroads, also known as uh, in the Union terms as the Battle of Tishomingo Creek. There's a little small creek running there behind the uh, behind the crossroads, and this was one of uh, one of Forrest's uh, most outstanding victories uh, as a cavalry officer. Um, what happened there was that uh, uh, Sherman was moving on Atlanta, and he had uh, all the way from Nashville down to uh, down to Atlanta. Uh, they had a series of, of supply uh, trains going back and forth, and uh, uh, Forrest was, you know, was interested in, you know, interrupting that supply train. Well, when uh, they found out that uh, that he was going to do that, they sent uh, General Sturgis out of uh, out of Michigan, Memphis, to attack Forrest, or at least to get him focused away from there. So uh, they did that and at uh, Bryce's Crossroads, um, Forrest attacked a, uh, a division that was much more, much larger than his own. And I think he had like 8,000, 8, I think the Union had like 8,000 soldiers and the, the, the Confederacy only had about 3,500. So they were extremely outnumbered, but Forrest, <laughs> Forrest never let that bother him too much. He, uh, he decided he'd go down there with him anyway, and he did. He, uh, he, uh, he did a very sound uh, uh, thrashing, I guess, or defeat, ran the, the Union Army all the way back to Memphis. And one of the things that, uh, that General Sturgis said, if, if Mr. Forrest will leave me alone, I will leave him alone. <laughs> so he didn't come back out and mess with Forrest. Again, so but it did take away uh, the uh, the attacking of, of Sherman's supply lines, and as Shelby Foote says in in his uh, story of Bryce's Crossroads, he said that that Sherman uh, that Forrest won the battle, Bryce's Crossroads, but Sherman won the war because he he was able to keep his supply lines open and move on to Atlanta. But, uh, you know, that was the, the story there. All right, after this, he became involved with the Battle of Franklin. Now, uh, what happened with Franklin, of course, when the Confederate Army took Atlanta, well, not took Atlanta, but when they were defeated in Atlanta, uh, they moved uh, toward Nashville. They were gonna go, and they were going to uh, uh, capture, if possible, Nashville. Hood, General Hood thought he could do that. So he he went that way. I think they, they even came close to here, didn't they, John? Started out here. Yeah. All the way up to Franklin. 
came pretty fast back. <laughs> but anyway, they went to Franklin. Uh, Franklin is unique. I haven't, uh, I haven't had my little hat here. I, I'm kind of uh, partial to the city, to the Battle of Franklin, but uh, it was one of the, uh, it was one of the biggest defeats, I guess. Uh, in fact, it was a slaughter pen, really. 6,000 uh, Confederate soldiers. Uh, so they started out about, about four o'clock in the afternoon and came in, even had the, uh, even had the, the band come in with the, uh, with the infantry charging into the, into the breastworks there at Franklin. And I remember John Cartwright, John Cartwright, uh, was first time I went to the, to the Carter House which was the focal point of the, of the Confederate charge. He said that there was a Union sergeant that was standing there watching the Confederates come in and they had all the, all the band with them and they were playing music. And I, he said it, it was the first time he had seen the shooters and the tutors coming in at the same time. So, <laughs> so uh, that, uh, that was kind of unique. But anyway, uh, there were so many, there was so many uh, uh, Confederates killed. And when they went out the next morning to view the battlefield, because it a lot of it happened after dark, uh, when they got out there, uh, some of the men were still standing up dead because there wasn't room enough to fall down. That's a uh, that's a kind of an, an awful thought. And it, picture you said picture that. Uh, Frank uh, Forrest was not allowed. He was there, but he was not. And, and Buford was too. But he was not allowed to attack the enemy. He was told to. Stay in reserve. He said, if you'll just give me permission to tell Hood this, I'll be glad to go and I can route them out in, uh, within an hour or two. But the Hood wanted a full-fledged frontal assault, and that's what he got. So I uh, wound up sacrificing uh, most of the army doing that. Of course, of course he went on to, uh, to Nashville, and when he went to Nashville, uh, George Thomas, sort of, who, was, who was in charge there, sort of stood there and watched him for a while. Uh, they kind of, were kind of afraid of, uh, kind of afraid of Hood. And then uh, Grant put a lot of pressure on, on Thomas to, to do something. In fact, he even got on the train uh, coming out of, uh, coming out of uh, Chattanooga. I believe that was Chattanooga, and he was going to go and take command himself. And uh, at that point, uh, Thomas went ahead and left Nashville and attacked the Confederate Army and was able to, to, to route them out and get them uh, to go and retreat. But retreat. Well, Buford uh, was uh, instrumental in Hood's retreat out of Nashville for the Second Battle of Nashville. All right, the big, next, big, the next big battle was the Battle of Selma. And of course, this was in April of 1865, you know, uh, when that, battle took place, the, uh, the life of the Confederacy wasn't going to be too much longer, you know, uh, Lee surrendered on uh, the 9th, April the 9th, I believe, right? Yeah. And uh, so this was on April the 2nd uh, that it took place here, as the Forest defeated, uh, he defended the city of Selma, and if you go there today, um, you'll notice that uh, Selma, is, you know, Forest is considered the uh, the savior of Selma or the uh, whatever, they, they've got a statue of him in the cemetery there. But uh, anyway, uh, one of the things that the person that he was, that he was uh, fighting there was uh, General James Wilson. And General Wilson, uh, uh, he and General Wilson got together. If you've ever been to an old Cahaba, anybody ever, ever been there to the old, yeah, there's a, uh, there's a house there, of course, no, no houses are standing anymore, but there's a, the remnants of an old house with the columns. You've seen that, the brick, uh, brick columns that were surrounded. It used to look better than you now, I'm sure. But that house that stood there uh, was where he and Forrest and General Wilson got together and they had cigars and drinks and all the niceties of uh, getting together after the fight and had dinner and uh, uh, one of, they did one of the things, Wilson did something that, that no one else was ever supposed to do, and that was exchange prisoners. Grant had, uh, 
and told them that no, you can't, can't you know, we're not gonna do any more exchanging, so we're gonna bleed the South dry because we, they can't replace their soldiers and we can. So we'll just let you take care of all those, all those prisoners. And, uh, but Wilson decided that they decided that the, bad, the war was so close to being over that they would go ahead and exchange prisoners, and they did. And uh, that happened in, in Selma, or right outside of Selma. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to this lovely town or not. Uh, right outside of Selma, or up, up the road a little bit, is a place called Gainesville. Anybody ever been here? You been to Gainesville? Gainesville is not much to talk about. It's where uh, the, that's where Forrest was camping when he surrendered uh, his army uh, at the end of the Civil War. Now, um, one of the things that uh, uh, they have, it's kind of funny, I went there with my wife, we were looking for, there's, there's a picture of it there, there's a monument there just to Forrest where he surrendered. And it's got his surrender on the back and his address to the troops on the back of the, of the monument. And I remember asking, <laughs> It's a totally black community. You know, it's a little rural area. And I remember asking the sheriff's deputy if he knew where this monument was. And he said, well, you know, I don't think I do. And I said, well, it's supposed to be around here somewhere. And little did either one of us know, we were sitting right in front of it. His <laughs> car was parked right in front of it. So I, I guess that they don't get a whole lot of people coming through there asking for, uh, for the monument. But anyway, <laughs> Uh, it's, uh, it's there uh, in, in Gainesville. So that was the end of, of Forrest and, uh, and Buford's involvement in the Civil War. Now after the war, uh, Buford retired back to uh, Bosque Bonita, which is the name of his, of, his, uh, of his farm there in Kentucky. And he raised horses and sold horses and then for a short time served in the state legislature there in Kentucky. Well, one of, the, one of the horses that he sold was uh, a horse named Comanche. And he sold this horse to uh, General George Custer, or who's then now, now Colonel George Custer. And uh, that was uh, in the 18, early 70s, I guess. And Custer was killed in 76. 76. In so anyway, but uh, as he sold that horse to, to Custer, he said, if, you, if you'll buy this horse, no Indian will ever be able to catch you. You know, this was a thoroughbred stallion. And he said, you, uh, you know, and so one of the things that happened at the, at the Battle of the Little Bighorn, Comanche was the only survivor of that entire battle. And uh, he, was, he was being uh, ridden by Miles Hino. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and uh, he, uh, when he was interesting, when the when the Indians killed all the people there, killed all the soldiers, they desecrated the bodies. They did things like gouged out eyes and stuck arrows in their ear, ears. And of course, the reasoning for this was they wanted to be able, able to, for the soldiers to hear better in the afterlife. So they punched their eardrums out. They stripped all their clothes off and basically desecrated the bodies of all of the soldiers except Captain Kehoe. Mm -hmm. And uh, Captain Kehoe happened to be holding the reins of Comanche. So the army took Comanche as the sole survivor. He went back to you know, their command headquarters and was, and was uh, retired. He didn't have to do any more service. He didn't have to do any more work. Didn't have to do anything but sleep and eat and run around and follow the, you know, the little fillies or whatever, whatever stallions do. Uh, that was what he did, yes. But he got, re, you know, retired. Okay. Later on, in the uh, early 80s, 1980s, uh, Buford's life sort of took a, a tragic turn. Uh, his son died of typhoid and uh, a couple of years later, his wife died, uh, you know, there in, in Kentucky, and it just devastated him. He was, uh, you know, was just kind of ruined after that point. His brother Thomas, 
uh, went bankrupt. And he filed, he was angry at the judge, who was a federal judge, so he wound up killing the federal judge. Well, Abraham spent a lot of money defending his brother, I guess to keep him away from the hangman. And uh, the brother was sentenced, was found to be innocent by reason of insanity. And he was sentenced to serve the rest of his life in the state mental hospital. Uh, Buford had to sell his, his farm, uh, give up uh, his infatuation with, with horses, and uh, fell on extreme financial hardship uh, while his brother was, uh, was lingering, you know, he was in the hospital. And uh, he went in 1884, he, uh, his brother, just before this event here, his brother escaped from the mental institution. And it was uh, written up in all the papers and got a lot of publicity. Uh, he, uh, he went to visit a friend in, uh, in Indiana. And uh, after he heard about his brother escaping from the mental institution, he took his service revolver, went into the bedroom and shot himself. Well, his body was returned to Louisville uh, at his request. But he was given no funeral and he was given no marker. So for 110 years, his grave was just unmarked. And uh, it was unmarked until, until uh, 1977. This is, this is a picture of, and if you know what this is, this is the standard uh, footstone that veterans get. The, gov the government, the you know, US government, uh, recognizes Confederate soldiers as much as you know, Union soldiers, and this is the standard uh, um, t uh, foot, foot marker that you get, and this is the only foot marker that, that Buford has on his grave. Well, in, um, in uh, 1977, the UDC uh, provided uh, funds to purchase that marker. Well, I mean, you get it. it. You have to go through. I think I think the government gives it to you, but you've got to make arrangements, you know, to have it put down and everything. So the UDC did that. And then because he had no funeral, the Sons of Confederate Veterans gave him a full military funeral uh, with guns and music and the whole nine yards that goes with it. Uh, I think that uh, that's one of the things that a lot of, a lot of people are critical of, the, uh, of both of these organizations. But I think this is one of the things that that they do that really uh, stands out uh, for people from the South, because we we belong here too. Sometimes. All right. Oh yeah. Well, that was uh, that was the end of that. Um, that was Abraham.
that infantry and cavalry have shared the same camp, and Sturgis wants the cavalry gone before trying to move the rest of his expedition. Soldiers pack their tents and move out, slogging down a road freshly traveled by over 3,200 horses. A few miles away, well, the column comes to a halt for cavalry moving land. Across the world, the creeks that locals call the Hatchie Bottom. Humidity hangs in the hot morning air along this stretch of road. It has turned into quicksand and gumbo mud. The rest of the soldiers pass a dead cavalry horse that fell into a white hole and suffocated before it could be rescued. Rumors circulate about drunkenness among the commanding generals. Morale is low. Colonel Edmund Rucker arrives at the head of his column of Mississippi and Tennessee horsemen. Training Rucker is a brigade of 500 Alabama cavalry under Colonel W.A. Johnson. With Morton's artillery and his own escort of 125 hand picked men, Forrest has no more than 4,800 men and eight cannon at his disposal, considerably fewer than 8,000 men and 22 cannon available to Sturgis. At the head of the Union column, Colonel George Waring leads the 1st Cavalry Brigade for the Federals. His advanced troopers spot a Confederate patrol a few miles north of the crossroads and give chase, losing them at Rice's White House, which stands at the intersection of the Guntown, Baldwin, and Potatock roads, and gives the crossroads its name. He sends the 4th Missouri head to scout the road. Musketry shatters the still morning. The Missouri troopers have met the advance of Lyons Brigade just beyond the Blackland Road. The Yankees dismount quickly and form lines where the road winds through a thick blackjack forest. Colonel Lyon knows what Forrest expects, and he dismounts and immediately orders his men forward to attack. It is a bold move. As Forrest predicted, the Union troopers cannot see through the heavy brook. Suddenly the rebels are upon them. Lyon's men are deadly for their end of life. The Kentucky men fight ferociously despite fearful losses in the face of the roaring Yankee defeaters. General Pearson orders a withdrawal to a strong defensive line astride the Baldwin Road. Union men hide in the blackjack along the fence line before a sloping cornfield. The artillery arrives, and four mountain howitzers are mounted on the road. Fearing a surprise attack in his rear, Pearson holds his second cavalry brigade under Colonel Edward Winslow at the Tishomingo Bridge. Forrest is now on the scene. While pleased with Lyon's initiative, he knows that he must continue to stall for time. At this moment, he has some 900 men on the field, over 150 of whom are in the rear of the lines holding the horses. Pearson will have 3,300 men and eight cannon when his second brigade arrives. If Forrest simply waits for the remainder of his troops, Pearson might detect his weakness and decide to attack. Forrest dismounts his own escort and orders another assault. The Confederates hold a defensive line along a split rail fence. They lay down sections of rail and move in a cornfield as a double row of skirmishers. The Union troopers blaze away. The houses open a defensive weapon. This is only a feint meant to buy time. The rebels avoid the Yankee volleys by throwing themselves to the ground, finding cover, and returning to fire carefully. A rise in the slope of the hill sheltered many of the rebels from Yankee fire. Pearson sends a courier back to Sturgis, asking for the infantry to be brought up quick. He also orders his 2nd Cavalry Brigade under Colonel Edward Winslow forward to link up to the Waring's right flank and extend the Union lines through the Blackjack Wood to the Guntown Road. Forrest sends a courier back to Bell's Brigade. They'll be able to move up fast and fetch all he's got. Lion skirmishers withdraw from the cornfield as Rucker's Brigade arrives on the field. Followed closely by Johnson's Alabamans. Forrest places Rucker on the left of Lyon. Johnson moves to the Confederate right. It is nearing 11 o'clock. Forrest orders another rock assault, testing the Yankee defenses. First with Rucker moving on the left, then Johnson in a loud demonstration on the Confederate right. The Union troopers blaze away from the woods. Thanks to their rapid firing guns, they are exhausted in their ammunition. Waring has watched Johnson's fate and worries about his left flank getting away. He knows he has Winslow's entire brigade protecting his right. He makes a fatal error and pulls the 2nd New Jersey from their position in reserve on his right and sends them to fight on his left. A large hole opens between the two cavalry brigades. Forrest is ready for a full assault. In his shirt sleeves, his coat on the pommel of the saddle, Forrest puts his horse up and down the line, looking like the very god of war in the words of one Confederate private. Lions 
although Forrest labeled it a hard fight. Union survivors said it was a massacre of the black garrison troops. Colonel Bartow's regiment has slogged through tiny bar roads all day trying to reach the Ripley Road. He finally arrives on the extreme of the Union left flank, making a loud commotion as his sharpshooters are placed on a hill. The 72nd Ohio returns fire from their position on the extreme Union left flank at the Tishunigo Bridge. Colonel Bowden sends several companies from the 55th U.S. Colored forward in support of the 72nd Ohio against Bartow's men on the hill. They come under heavy fire, and within moments, many of their officers are dead. In the confusion, two officers argue about where to park the wagon train, finally moving them across the narrow Tishkingo Bridge toward the battlefield. All across the front, the battle lines are in confusion as fighting rages in the heavy timber and undergrowth is now filled with the acrid smoke of the spent powder. Ammunition runs low throughout the Union ranks. The men on both sides are exhausted from the heat, humidity, and close combat. Forrest hears Bartow's guns and knows he's in position near the Union rear. He encourages his worn-out men, preparing them for one final charge. Get up, men. I've ordered Bell to charge on the left. When you hear his guns and the bugle sounds, every man must charge. And we will give them hell. Morton's cannon fires from a rise on the ball the road. Forrest rides up, assessing the Union battle line through his steel glasses. Forrest tells Morton to load four of his cannons with double shots of canister, lethal against infantry at close range. He orders Morton, at the sound of the attack, to charge with his cannon down the Baldwin Road. This is against all the rules of warfare, but Forrest knows he has to break the Yankees now. There is one very weak place in the Union lines, and Forrest has found it. It is the 113th Illinois which guards the Baldwin Road. These soldiers are new recruits, and this is their first fight. As Forrest Buechler sounds the charge, the veterans move forward and roar with yells and musket fire. <coughs> Most artillery clatters down the Baldwin Road, and the cannon are put to gun limber, the muzzles spinning toward the soldiers of the 113th. Morton's guns fire. The canister rips through branches, trees, and men's flesh. The guns belch another round of fire and iron, and the 113th breaks, withdrawing in confusion. Rucker's men pour into the gap, turning the flank of Hoag's brigade. The Union center disintegrates into chaos. Morton's artillery continues its charge, the crews pushing the cannon forward by hand. McMillan forms another line at the crossroads. The Confederate lines now form a ring around the compact Union formation. A concentrated rifle fire pours into the Yankees. They hear their cannon in the rear, opening up Bartow, along with his answering fire. Rebels advance steadily through the woods. Panic seizes the Union soldiers as Forrest charges the crossroads. Two Union artillery crews abandon their guns. Morton's gunners quickly turn the captured Yankee cannon on the retreating blue coats. General Sturgis described the confusion from his position by the creek. The troops from all directions came crowding in like an avalanche from the battlefield, and my control over this moving mass ceased at this time. The Union retreat has turned to rout. Both Sturgis and McMillan ride to the rear with Waring's cavalry. They say that they want to check the route, but their absence only increases confusion and panic. The Union wagon train has now recrossed the narrow Tishomingo Bridge. Barco Sharpshoot has forced steady fire onto the bridge and creek. A detachment of forest escorts crosses the creek a quarter mile below the bridge and charges the retreating Yankee column, capturing a wagon and increasing the panic. Terrified Yankee soldiers rush to the creeks in the bottom as Colonel Bowden of Color Brigade, Colonel Wilkins with the 72nd Ohio, and Colonel Winslow of the 2nd Cavalry Brigade throw together a rear guard defense that saves the expedition from immediate capture. The Yankees fight fiercely, holding the bridge and creek until most of the wagons and horses have crossed. Under heavy fire, the rear guard retreats in order. Forrest urges his men on. Warms artillery crews advance along the river road, firing as they go. Across the open bottomland and up the ridges, the soldiers of the Color Brigade make stand after stand, pouring furious fire into the advancing Confederates and giving ground grudgingly to Morton's deadly cannon fire and the constant flanking of forest horsemen. As the sun drops below the horizon, the Yankees make a final effort to halt forest advance at Reverend Agnew's house. Colonel Wilkins organizes the remnants of his 2nd Infantry Brigade on the left of the road. The determined Colonel Bowden places his 59th U.S. Color into line on the right. Morton's artillery has kept steady pressure on the retiring Yankees. His exhausted crews have now pushed those cannons three miles by hand. Forrest leads his cavalry around Wilkins' flank, 
as Colonel Bell orders his men to fix bayonets. The color crew is charged, driving rifles back 500 yards and threatening works batteries. But Colonel Wilkins withdraws his line. The 59th U.S. car is flanked on both sides, then surrounded, and retreats in confusion through the dark and blizzard bottoms. The Teamsters abandon the remaining wagons and cannon as they become mired in the dark, swampy, hatchy bottom. Nothing will stop the Union route now. The commander of the colored troops, Bowden, uh, had good men. He knew they were good men. He wanted a chance to use them. And uh, apparently, the Sturgis mistrusted their fighting abilities or something and uh, held them back at the times when they would have been most useful uh, on the retreat. They were only so easy to make any kind of substantial stand. Mr. 